Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of my deep dive into Parallax. In this one we're going to talk about a different kind of input method than the previous versions where we've mainly been focused on scroll-based parallax effects. In this one we're going to explore mouse-based parallax, so using the mouse movement as input to affect our parallax animation. So let's dive in. So here you can see the end result of what we're going to be creating in this episode. You can see as I move the mouse around the parallax effect sort of follows and shift itself towards the mouse. So we also have this element rotating as well as these layers being moved at their various offsets. And it all sort of rotates around that core mouse position. We also have an interesting gradient effect which we're going to apply which follows the mouse and adjusts its angle and opacity based on the distance from center and the angle of the mouse relative to that center position. So if you look at the file we have to start out with, we really just have this container element. And this is where we're going to inject our SVG content that we're going to use to create this parallax effect. We're going to use two libraries. One is TweenMax, and here's the CDN for TweenMax, and then Snap SVG, and here's that. And TweenMax is going to help us out with some of the um, animations and transitional effects and Snap SVG is going to help us actually dynamically draw the SVG content that we're going to be manipulating. So if you've already seen episode 3 on Parallax, where we drew all our content into a canvas element, you'll remember that we had to manually load all our assets ahead of time so that they were ready when we needed them. We have to do the same thing here, and we can actually leverage the same script that I wrote for Adobe Illustrator to collect the X and Y values of our layers ahead of time. So next I'm going to create a layers array, which is ultimately going to store all the images we create. We're going to store the width and height of our SVG element as variables. Then we're also going to set up a loaded variable, set it to zero, and this is going to track which assets are loaded. Then we're going to get a reference to our container element where we're going to inject our SVG content. Then leveraging snap SVG, we're going to create a new snap object with the width and height. So this is going to create our SVG element in snap SVG. And then we're simply going to append the SVG node of that snap element to our container. So next I'm going to create a couple of groups in SVG. And these are just going to be containers for some of our content. So we're going to have a basic group, which is G for everything. And then we're going to have C, which is going to be a group for all of our image layers. Then we simply add our C group, our image layer group, to G, which is our main group for everything. So next we're just going to iterate over those um, images that we had defined in that array, so our assets array, and then create images for each of these, defining the source and then loading them. We're also going to create SVG image elements using the same data that we had in our array and we're going to append those to our C group. So this is our group of image layers. And then we're also going to push that image onto our layers array just for use later. Then in our load handler, we're going to increment our loaded variable by one for each image that's loaded. And then we're going to check that variable against the total number of assets so that when they're all loaded, we're going to fire our handle loaded method. Then inside our handle loaded method, we're going to add event listeners to our container element. And we're going to add our mouse move, our mouse out, and our mouse over event listeners to this element. And we're doing it to the container so that our hit area doesn't change as we manipulate the contents of it. So we can scale and distort the inner contents of this container visually, but the hit area that the mouse is going to interact with won't change, so we won't get any weird results. So if you preview this now, you'll see all our layers are loaded. Now they're covered up by the mask element, so if we go back in and disable the mask and then preview it again, you'll see all our content laid out the way that we want it to be. So now we're going to add some interactivity by populating our mouse events. And the end result we want is we want that when you hover over this container element, the SVG element inside of it will scale up. So in order to do this, we're going to set the initial scale of this element to 0.9. So we're going to use TweenMax to set the initial scale to 0.9, referencing the snap SVG node. Then we're going to go into our mouse over event, 
and tween that to 1. So we're going to set the scale to 1 and the duration to 0.2 seconds. We're going to use an easing here of back ease out, and this will overshoot our target some to create this nice buoyant easing effect. Next, we're going to populate the mouse out and just reset the scale. So we'll go tween max 2, another duration of 0.2 seconds, and set the scale back to 0.9 using a different kind of ease, a quadratic ease out. So we get the smooth ease out animation as it goes back to its resting state. So let's just test that all quick to make sure it all works. We get this nice mouse over effect and then we get our mouse out. So the next thing we want to do is actually apply our parallax effect to all the layers. And we're going to do this on mouse move. So let's go into our mouse move handler. And what we're first going to do is get the distance from the center position of our element, so the mouse distance from center. And we need to do this on both the X and Y axis. So we'll do this by getting the offset X and subtract that by half the width and then do the same thing for the Y axis. So we'll get the offset Y, the mouse position, and subtract that from half the height. Then we're going to loop through all of our layers, access that layer's offset, and we're going to set our X and Y position for that layer based on the distance from center along the X axis multiplied by that layer's offset. And then again, the same thing for the Y axis. So multiply the distance from center on the Y axis of the mouse multiplied by that layer's offset. And then we're going to set these with a tween just so we get a smooth transition to that position for each layer's node in Snap. And we'll set it to 0.1 seconds, so we'll be really quick, but we'll just set those X and Y transforms. Then we wanna make sure all our layers reset when we mouse out. So we need to go into our mouse out handler and loop through all the layers and then set the X and Y position of those back to zero from whatever their offset is when we mouse out of the element. If we test this now, you can see we get our nice parallax effect where all the layers are animating based on the mouse position multiplied by their offset, which creates this cool visual effect as we move around here. And then you can see as we mouse out, all the layers go back to their default state. It's nice and smooth. Next, what we're gonna do is apply a 3D rotation based on the mouse movement so that our SVG element appears to follow the mouse visually rotating in 3D space. So, so to do this, we're gonna go back into our mouse move event and apply a tween to our SVG node of 0.2 seconds. And we're gonna adjust the rotation Y and the rotation X and use those distance variables. So the distance from center along each axis and divide it by 10. And then on the X axis, we have to invert it negative so that we get, get the right angle rotation that we want. Then we need to make sure that we go back and reset it on mouse out. So we back, go back into that tween that we had in our mouse out handler and also set the rotation X and rotation Y back to, the, to zero. So if we test that out, you can see we get this nice effect of, the, of our whole element rotating towards the mouse as we rotate around the element. And as we mouse out, everything goes back flat and resets to its default position. So next we're going to apply our mask. So let's go back into that array of all of our layers and enable our mask layer again. Then we're going to go into our handle loaded method. So this is when all our, our images are loaded and we're going to get the layer that is our last layer in that array and use that as the mask. So apply that as a mask onto our group element. So this is the group container that contains all of our co content within our SVG. And then let's test that out. And you can see we now have this shape masking all of that content. So we don't have the square anymore. Now we've actually got this neat shape that's able to mask it and reveal the layers, the parts of the layers that we want visible. Next, we're gonna add some shading to the element as it rotates to add the illusion of lighting and depth. We're gonna do this by applying a gradient across the image. We're going to create a gradient in Snap by calling S gradient and then passing in the string that represents our gradient. You can check out the syntax for this in the Snap documentation, but what it's basically doing 
is setting the x and y coordinates of the start position of our gradient and the x and y coordinates of the end position. So we're going from the top left to the lower right. Then we're creating the start color and the end color. So it's going from black at 50% opacity to black at zero opacity. And then we're just setting the whole thing to 75% opacity. Then we're creating a rectangle with the width and height of our element and we're going to fill that with our gradient and set the opacity to one. Then we're just going to add that to our main group. So now what we want to do is we want to adjust the angle of that gradient and its opacity relative to its relationship to the center. So the distance from the center is going to affect the opacity and the angle is going to adjust the angle of our gradient. So for the angle, what we can do is we can use the dx and dy values that we have and pass that into the math arctangent2 method. Then for our opacity, what we're going to do is get the math square root of dx squared plus dy squared. Then we can simply go in and tween our gradient element to the opacity. You may want to spend some time playing around with the opacity values just to get things right and looking exactly how you want. I spent some time doing that here and I actually ended up going back and changing some of my opacity values so that the um, initial start opacity was one of my black gradient and the entire gradient opacity itself was 100%. Now that we've got the opacity being adjusted, we need to adjust the angle of the gradient. And to do that, we're going to create a new method called angle to points, and we're going to pass in our angle, and then we're going to convert it to points for our gradient. Now, inside this method, there's going to be a lot going on, so I wanted to break this out into its own simple demo to kind of show what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. So I'm going to hop over to Copen and we're going to populate this method um, in this standalone example and then bring it back into our main application. The simplest way to get points from our angle is to take our angle and get the cosine of that angle for x and then the sine of the angle for y. Now this is going to return a range of values from negative 1 to positive 1. What we need to do for this method is return our start and end points of our gradient. And this ranges from zero to one. So what we need to do for our start points is take those values, see if they're less than zero, and if so, convert them to one. Otherwise, convert them to zero. And this is because we want those start points to always be the corners of our gradient. Now for the end points, we want to check to see if they're greater than zero. If they are, keep them at their value. Otherwise, add one to convert them into a positive number. So if we test this, you can see it's actually following the mouse. The gradient is turning with the mouse and you can see the radius that we're covering with the blue line that moves with the mouse. If you'll notice, the gradient doesn't completely cover our square. It doesn't completely cover the area. And this is because we want that line to meet the other end of the circle. We want it to cover the circumference of that circle so the gradient will completely envelope the square. So in order to do that, we need to do some other calculations. The first thing we're going to do is get the segment so that we can determine what portion of the circle we're dealing with based on which quadrant we're in. And we'll do this by flooring this number of the angle over pi times 2. So the angle in radians over 360 degrees in radians. Next we're going to get the angle of the diagonal line from that quadrant to the next. So we're going to multiply the segment by half and then add one quarter. And then we're going to multiply this by pi. Then we need to get the new radius for this circle, the blue circle. So we're going to get the, take the cosine of the absolute value of our diagonal angle subtracted from our original angle, so the difference between these two values. 
then we're going to multiply that by the square root of 2, which is going to give us the radius. Then we simply take this value and multiply it by our original cosine and sine of the angle that we had previously. So you can see now that at each quadrant, our blue line is rotating around the circumference of the circle. So we get the gradient going from one end of the square completely across to the other end of the square, which is the end result that we want. I want to note too that if you want to invert the gradient, if you need to flip it, you can always go back to your segment and if you add 2 to it, it's going to flip the values so that you get the opposite color from one end to the next. So here you can see we just copy and pasted the contents of that method into our code here. And if we test that, you can see we now have our gradient following the mouse and shifting, and rotating with the element as it rotates in space based on the angle, which is just what we wanted. So I'm going to go in here and make the gradient a lot darker just so we get, it's a little bit more visible. So you can see it's really dark here as it follows the mouse around the element. Now what we need to do is we need to make sure that when we hover off of it, we reduce the opacity of our gradient back to zero. So we just go back into our mouse out event and add a tween for the opacity, setting it back to zero. And there you have it. We've got our hover effect. We've got this cool parallax effect of these layers sort of shifting and following the mouse around. We also have our element rotating in 3D space to follow the mouse. And this nice gradient that adds this illusion of lighting and depth going on. When you mouse out, it just resets to the way it was. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.